A prophet doesn't foretell the future, but properly names the present, the present in function of the future. Okay. A prophet reads where the finger of God is within everyday life, in function of naming our fidelity or infidelity to God, and in function of pointing out to our, uh, our future in terms of God's plan for us. I'm going to give you a series of lines there that define prophecy. Richard Rohr says, that's supposed to be not everything. Not, the, not everything can be fixed or cured, but it should be named properly. See, prophets don't foretell the future. Prophets properly name the present. You know, what, what's happening? But they name it not, not so much sociologically and so on. Sometimes they do that too, but they say, where, where, how is God feeling about America right now? Not about the future. So how, how is God looking at, you know, um, how is God looking at the, the, the situation in, in North Korea right now? You know, how is God looking at the situation where our kids aren't going to church anymore? And so on. See, a prophet tries to name, where's God's finger in this? Or James Hillman, one of my favorite philosophers, he says, a symphon suffers most when it doesn't know where it belongs. It's a good line. Well, you, ever, I'm sure you've all been through it. Where sometimes you get a symptom. And you don't know what it is. It's my God, that might be cancer. It might be this or whatever. Maybe I got a brain tumor or whatever. You see a doctor and he says, well, no, that, that's actually arthritis. It's not a pleasant thing. But now you know what you have. <laughs> see, the symptom suffers most when it doesn't know, doesn't know where it belongs. And today, there are a lot of symptoms. You know, what does it mean that so many young people aren't going to church? What does it mean that our country is so split right now that's never been split like that since the Civil War? What does it mean that the world is polarizing? What does it mean that uh, the gap between rich and poor is growing rather than, r rather than closing with all the economic development? What does it mean? And so on. Or even like natural disasters. What does it mean that Houston got flooded? What does it mean that Puerto Rico took two hurricanes in two weeks? And so on. Um, now it's interesting. Biblically, um, biblically, the prophets would interpret every event as somehow connecting to God, even natural disasters and so on. And, and you know, sometimes we misunderstand their language because in the Old Testament, they make it sound as if God caused it. If an Old Testament prophet were writing about, you know, um, the hurricanes to say, well, God caused the hurricane, and we're supposed to learn something from it. Now, today we say, no, God didn't cause it, but God speaks through it. Jim Wallace, who's one of our prophets today, I think he's as close to Dorothy Day as we have. And Jim Wallace always says, see what you think of this line. Wallace says, you know what the problem is in the church and in the world? It's that the conservatives get it, and they invariably get it wrong. He said the liberals don't get it at all. And this is one of those cases, you know. For instance, conservatives uh, do this. They try to read it and oftentimes get it wrong. So when Jerry Falwell says, you know, when AIDS was first diagnosed, Jerry Falwell said, this is God's punishment for sexual promiscuity. God gave AIDS to this world. Well, no. God didn't cause AIDS. And then liberals say that's, that's so far, that has nothing to do with God. No. God didn't cause AIDS, but God speaks through AIDS. Okay. God didn't cause the tornado, but God says something through the tornado. C.S. Lewis used to say, he said, Tragedy and pain is God's microphone to a deaf world. Now, it's interesting. God is speaking all the time, except other times we aren't listening. <laughs> you know, so, so I'll give you an example. With the Houston, um, with, with Harvey, you know, that's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing, and God didn't cause it. But notice what happened. Um, we went through a few weeks since then where we've been closer as people than ever before. In Houston after Harvey, there were no Democrats or Republicans, there were no black, there were no white, there were no, and everybody was one. The biggest experience of community we've had, some people in their whole lifetime, just all of a sudden all the differences were brothers and sisters under God. You know, the hurricane did some of its work. <laughs> now God didn't cause the hurricane, but God spoke through that hurricane and so on. See, now God is speaking all the time, wish we, except we're not listening, you know. Um, so like C.S. Lewis says, God's the pain, it's God's microphone. Or John of the Cross, my favorite theologian, he says, 
the language of God is the experience that God writes into your life. God doesn't send typewritten letters from heaven, you know. Um, stuff happens, and you've got to read it. What's God saying to me? And so on. Or Jesus, Jesus' expression with Jesus, read the signs of the times. So it's a prophetic thing. John Hegel says, a prophet is a meteorologist of the spirit. I like that. Meteorologists, they, they, they read weather. Prophets are supposed to read inner weather. Let me give you an example. Um, when I was teaching in Edmonton, I used to teach a course on religious experience. And what I do each year for, for their assignment, I would take 10 people from the class, because we got larger than 10, it didn't work that well, into a seminar on religious experience. And I would try to choose them so that you'd have some married people, some celibates, some seminarians, some, some Catholics, some Protestants, and just you get a, a kind of a mix. And so I'd ask them to do this. I said, come back next week and write up in, in, in less than three pages. We're not looking for, you know, a 102-page autobiography. Just write up one experience where in your life you felt you got it. You, 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 something happened to you and you got God's message in it. Well, during the years, there were some marvelous stories, except they aren't my stories, so I can't publish them. But I want to tell you one of the stories. So talk about you know, reading the signs of the times, the language of God. Actually, you know, James Mackey, I should have typed this out. James Mackey, the great Irish theologian. Mackey says, remember he used to have an expression called divine providence? He says, divine providence is, providence is a conspiracy of accidents through which God speaks. I like that. See, there, it's a conspiracy of accidents through which God speaks. So this is a story. It was a woman, actually was an American. And she had grown up in... Iowa, and she said, I grew up in a Catholic family. She said, oh, we were very Catholic. Went to Mass, and went to church, and so on. She said, uh, said then I went to college, and slowly through the four years of college, said, I drifted. She said, wasn't I even angry at the church? Just lazy, not sure, I'm not sure I believe this anymore. Said, so I went to church less and less. So she said, after I stopped college, and when I'd go home, I'd still go to church to please my parents, but after I went, she thought, I don't believe this stuff, so I don't go to church. Said, and I hadn't been to church for eight years when this incident happened. Said, I went to Colorado to visit my sister. She said, and um, my sister said, a baby, and I went out there to visit the sister. I mean, she was going to stay for two weeks. But she said, the purpose of the trip was to ski in Colorado and see her sister's new baby. So she goes there. Remember, hasn't been to church for eight years. And she said, um, and I get there on a Saturday, visited my sister. And Sunday morning, my sister asked, do you want to go to church with me? She says, no, I won't go. Her sister went to Mass, and she went on a ski run. And she said on her very first trip down the hill, she hit a tree and broke her leg. Now, God didn't arrange that, you know. So she gets her leg put in a cast, but she's there for two weeks. So the next Sunday, her sister said, I want to go to Mass. She said, well, broken leg, hasn't been to Mass. Yet. She's going to go to Mass. <laughs> so she goes. First time at church in eight years. So I'm sitting at the very back. She said, so the priest couldn't see me. But he said, but talk about conspiracy of accidents. It happened to be Good Shepherd Sunday, and there happened to be a visiting priest from Israel who gave this homily. So the priest began his homily this way. He says, you know, he said, there's a, there's a custom among sheep farmers in Israel said, that existed at the time of Jesus, still exists today. He said, and he works this way. He said, sometimes when a lamb is born, and the shepherd noticed that this lamb is just going to be a congenital stray. This lamb is never going to stay with the flock. I grew up on a farm, and cattle do that sometimes. You look at a baby calf and realize, this one is, is a wild one. Okay? <laughs> this, this one is not going to stay with the herd. You know? So what the, the shepherd will do when it's very young, he'll take it and deliberately break its leg. He said, see, then he has to carry the sheep for about six to eight weeks. And the sheep can't walk, so it has to be on the shoulders all the time. Said, but, and so by the time the leg heals, it's so attached to the shepherd, it never leaves again. Said, so I'm sitting in the back with my leg and cast. And I go, <laughs> she said, now I'm not that swift, but I'm not that stupid either. She said, <laughs> said, now that was a good number of years ago. She said, I have never missed church since. <laughs> okay. See, the language of God is the experience God writes into our life. And see, in prophecy, you know, isn't just about justice. It is, you know. Um, you, you have to read the inner weather 